Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today, this, this afternoon. As a short introduction, my name is Jessica Chiam. I'm Managing Director of Eco Business, and I'm delighted to be your moderator today. I'd first like to thank JTC and Bridge Plus for organizing this webinar and the invitation to moderate it. I think that this is a very timely discussion because climate change has been on the rise on our national agenda, and Singapore has strengthened its climate targets as a signatory to the Paris Agreement on climate change this year. Around the world, sustainability and ESG issues have also risen to the top as material and financial issues that businesses need to look at. The ongoing coronavirus pandemic has been deeply felt across all industries and societies, but while we grapple with the short-term challenges of COVID-19, we should not take our eyes off the long-term challenges. Experts are estimating that in the next decade or two, the economic damage caused by climate change will likely be as bad as having a COVID-sized pandemic every 10 years. And by the end of the century, it will be much worse if the world remains on its current emissions path. So with this in mind, I think it's with utmost urgency that we look at how to decarbonize our economy and how to integrate sustainability in all aspects of our business operations. Today's topic is concretizing sustainability in Singapore's industrial and business park spaces. By the way, I love the play on words there for the real estate industry on concretizing. Um, I, I think that it's high time that we scrutinize Singapore's industrial and business parks to identify where are the opportunities to integrate sustainability. As you are aware, our industrial and business parks are heavy users of energy and they house companies that make up the backbone of Singapore's economy. So how can we engage companies whether SMEs or multinationals, to capitalize on the opportunities that sustainability presents and to help them future-proof their business. This is what we will be discussing today. And at this juncture, I am delighted to introduce our three distinguished speakers. We have with us Mr. Kelvin Chung, Chief Environmental Officer of JTC, Ms. Lynette Leong, Chief Sustainability Officer of Capital Land Group, and Mr. Prescott Gaylord, Head of Sustainability for Corporate Real Estate Strategy and Administration, DBS. I'm very excited to hear from each one of them and to engage in dialogue on this important topic. I'd like to er encourage everyone, all our attendees, to engage in this dialogue by either putting your thoughts in our chat box or to support or to submit your questions so that we can take some of them later during the conversation. And that can be done in the Q&A box. So without further ado, I'd now like to invite Kelvin to share his thoughts on JTC's sustainability commitment and vision for our industrial estates. Kelvin, over to you. Hi, Jessica. Thank you very much for your introduction. So uh, I'm the first speaker, so I will try to uh, keep this short and uh, set the context for the subsequent discussion later on. Uh, I think some of these you already covered. Uh, I just want to highlight the point that uh, uh, with the movement of uh, sustainability across all countries, uh, it has become, I think Singapore has already realized that uh, moving forward in the future, carbon will be our new constraint for Singapore. Uh, this is uh, on top of our constraint for land and for manpower. And uh, not only the countries are taking action, concrete actions, uh, even major companies like Shell and Facebook have already pledged their uh, sustainability plans for the coming future. So we are, like what you say, I totally agree with you. We are gaining quite a, quite a foothold on this movement. And I think the movement will just go stronger as we progress towards uh, uh, 2030. So uh, yeah, we were progressing well in uh, for Singapore, we started about maybe say two years ago and we really take a serious look at this uh, sustainability and carbon issue. Uh, and uh, very unfortunately, this year we have this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, a lot of people ask whether the COVID-19 has actually affected the movement. Uh, actually, we see opportunities uh, that arises from the COVID-19 uh, instead. i just give you three uh, particular trends that I, I, I think we are looking at. Uh, during the lockdown across the whole world, you know, we are seeing economic activities uh, slowing down and with that, a lot of manufacturing has also stopped. And uh, I, I think we are, it's the first time in maybe the last 50 years or since the Industrial Revolution that we start to see very blue sky and uh, very low admission during the two or three months of the lockdown. So uh, the other part is that, well, businesses uh, actually uh, go onto the hot. Uh, it's also 
timely that we can restart it with a sustainability in mind. So that gives us actually another opportunity to uh, improve in this uh, aspect. The other important uh, trend that we see is that uh, we are now all like just like what we are currently doing. We realize that teleconferencing can become the de facto norm for collaboration. I think that will really uh, the way we collaborate in the future. Uh, and that will drastically reduce the uh, transport necessary and that will in, in turn uh, reduce the amount of a carbon footprint from all the perhaps we can say now uh, unnecessary travel. Uh, and uh, the third trend that we see uh, is that um, nations are now realizing that um, we cannot totally be dependent on uh, import and export or global trade. I do not think that um, global trade will be completely uh, reduced. Uh, it will still be a major component uh, of uh, many countries' uh, economy. But the point here is that, well, every country tries to uh, become more sustainable, uh, subsistent rather, uh, it will also cut down in the way uh, the amount of uh, transport needed for all the goods and services uh, across nations. Uh, that will again drastically reduce the amount of carbon footprint for all these transportation. Actually, uh, just my own personal observation is also that uh, the lockdowns has a sort of a nudge consumer activities, at least in Singapore. Uh, at least from my point of view and from my wife's point of view, she has uh, reduced her shopping, <laughs> uh, her consumerism rather. I think that will also again uh, help to reduce the overall carbon emission in the future. So uh, I'm sure you all are quite familiar with this chart. Uh, I just want to uh, highlight that Singapore's emission uh, will peak in uh, 2030 with uh, 64 million uh, tons of carbon. And uh, we have pledged that we will reduce that amount by half by 2050. Uh, that's a very, uh, in my opinion, ambitious target. And a lot of things have to be done. And uh, we are just starting out. Uh, we are considering many policy levers, but at the moment, if you uh, we are, it's just like how uh, Singapore does things. So we need to consider all aspects before we roll them out. So at the moment, well, you see that we currently only have the carbon tax and also our solar target, which are more properly announced. Uh, rest assured that many other policies are now being discussed internally with the government and we will roll them out uh, when we are ready. So for uh, so what is it in it for JDC? Actually for us, uh, it's again about uh, the survival of our nation, just like how we started the industrial revolution uh, 50 years, over years ago. Uh, we think that it's no longer an auction, but rather a thing that we need to do a must uh, uh, to go to be sustainable in order to continue our industrial journey. And uh, if you all have, if Singapore has learned from our, our uh, COVID-19 experience, uh, we have to diversify our economy. So therefore, manufacturing will always be uh, a part of our economy. And in order to support this uh, 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 manufacturing, we will therefore have to uh, make sure that uh, they are done in a sustainable way uh, in order for us, uh, for Singapore to meet our uh, global commitment to reduce our uh, carbon footprint. So we, uh, at the same time, we also see that uh, uh, we can create new business opportunities of this uh, sustainability uh, by researching on sustainable uh, technologies and build out our capabilities and manpower capabilities in this area and research capabilities. We hope, we think that perhaps the uh, sustainability related industry could be another uh, uh, driving force for our economy uh, in the future. And we really hope so because uh, uh, if you look at the, the next couple uh, decades, uh, the East Asia, Southeast Asia especially, will be a main growth of energy. So there'll be a lot of opportunities for us to uh, uh, to capture in this aspect. So um, for JTC, we uh, embark, we actually, frankly, we only started a couple of years ago. Uh, we have uh, grouped our sustainability efforts in a few baskets over here. You can see on, on, the, on the diagram. Uh, a few that are more publicly uh, known are our efforts in uh, pre-planting uh, as well as uh, renewable energy, especially in terms of solar. 
But as, as well, uh, but internally, we are also trying to optimize our operations. Uh, we, our buildings, our new builds are all uh, aiming for a high green mark uh, status. And uh, we are also starting to look at how we can build sustainably. So this part is uh, it's not only in Singapore, but uh, GQ worldwide. It's uh, not a very well-known, uh, uh, well-established aspect of sustainability construction. So perhaps in this aspect, we Singapore could also take the lead uh, in driving sustainability for construction, especially in figuring out what should be the baseline and what are the uh, needle movers that we need to do to improve the construction sustainability. Uh, that will drastically reduce the embedded carbon in our buildings and infrastructure. So I just want to end off with this note that uh, through our few years, last few years of our sustainability efforts, uh, uh, it's not always a cost. In fact, uh, if you look at our solar program and our uh, our drive for green mark buildings, we realize that we not only save money from all the uh, utilities bills that we uh, from our our green mark building, but we also start to earn extra income from our solar efforts. So uh, we are also very heartened that uh, well, we try to uh, engage our industrial industrialists and companies uh, in this effort, uh, there are actually many enlightened companies that actually join us in this effort and they, they in our tree planting effort and in, in our our effort to build uh, the first reef garden, coral, coral reef garden in Singapore, they actually donated uh, very generously and also physically in terms of helping us to plant the trees. So very like uh, heartened that they are also, uh, they are, we have uh, such a spirit in our uh, companies, even uh, we start uh, uh, driving sustainability, sustainability uh, aggressively throughout the industry. So uh, the other part about uh, creating opportunities is also that uh, we also realize that uh, through our Drone Island Renewable uh, Call for Proposal, as well as our Circular Economy Study, uh, we have found uh, new opportunities for us to convert some of the waste uh, to become feedstock for another uh, for other activities. So with that, that will means that uh, the companies will now need to spend less uh, to uh, take care of the uh, waste that they have generated and actually turn them into op new opportunities. So uh, on that note, I'll pass it my time back to uh, Jessica for her to continue with the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Calvin, for those insights. We'll come back to you later on about JTC's role in, sustain in sustainability in our industrial estates. But for now, I'd like to inv invite Lynette Leong, Chief Sustainability Officer of Capital Land Group, to share with us her insights on Capital Land's sustainability commitments and initiatives. Lynette, the floor is yours. Um, I think you're still on mute, Lynette. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. This is one of the most <laughs> words on mute. Uh, <laughs> good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I cannot see you, uh, but I hope you're having a good day. And I'm just very pleased to be invited to be on this esteemed panel by JTC and to be moderated by Jessica herself, who is a very prominent and a passionate and influential speaker uh, in sustainability. So um, I very interestingly, what Calvin mentioned about the reduction in consumerism uh, uh, because as a result of COVID-19, uh, the interesting thing is that because of that, of course, there's greater access to goods and services due to e-commerce. And I find that my husband, uh, who did not like shopping, has become a, a bit shopper. <laughs> uh, so let me see. Yeah, I, I've got a... Okay, all right. So, well, sustainability in capital land uh, is something that we is very close in, in, at our hearts. And so, what we are looking, how we look at sustainability, is is at the core of what we do because it is not something good to have. It is now becoming more and more mainstream, and you find that it is the same in many organizations now. And we feel that it is important to help our employees understand this aspect because uh, in the day-to-day, -day, not just their lifestyle, but the, in our business operations, we need to put sustainability in at the forefront. And uh, so that's why we want to relate sustainability to the economic benefits of uh, 
of our business operations so that when we integrate that into the business, we can see the impact that we make uh, to the planet, to people, to society as well. So in the past 12 years, we have been on this sustainability journey. And I have to say that we have been taking on from a more compliance perspective. But what that meant was we have built ourselves a pretty strong foundation for us to take it to the next level. So here, um, I'm not going to dwell on into the some of the awards that we received. It's not just about the awards, but uh, it is really building that groundwork. And uh, I wanted to just highlight a few things. And and while we are receiving awards, we also measure the impact that we have made over the last 12 years. And this gives us a very strong baseline to move that to the next level. And so with that, we also have been able to secure sustainable finance because of the the good performance we have received. And to date, uh, this is a bit out to date, actually it's about $3 billion uh, sing dollars so far in sustainable finance. And we are operating in a very capital intensive business. So money is very important to help us to fund our sustainable projects. And I'll come to that a bit more later on. Um, one of the challenges that uh, we are faced with is that Capital is a pretty big uh, business and we operate in in more than 220 cities around the world. And that increases the complexity uh, when we look at sustainability. And added to that, we cover almost every single asset class. Every asset class has got a different need, different customers, different uh, uh, property specifications, different energy consumption. You know, so so that that increases sustainability when we the when we when we look at it. Um, but what is important is that we feel we must be able to have a certain strategy to move the entirety, the entire company forward on a common purpose. And uh, so we are developing a sustainability master plan, which will be unveiled in the next uh, couple of weeks. So unfortunately, I cannot disclose more details, but I'll just give you a sneak preview later on. Or um, because JTC is so nice to us. <laughs> um, so in sustainability, of course, for a real estate developer, energy is the most important part. And for all our buildings, we always target at the highest possible green mark certification. In Singapore, it's green mark, but overseas, there are other types of green certifications. Um, so uh, in, we are very pleased that this year we managed to secure, become the first logistics property to secure the uh, Green Mark Platinum Super Low Energy Award. And that means having to reduce our energy consumption by 40%. That's a really major feat. Um, and uh, traditionally, most of our properties, when we design our buildings, we, we look at uh, not just energy, but we look at the comfort of our customers. So again, because sustainability is about looking at everything holistically. So for the occupiers, and uh, so in our latest uh, property that is going to be rolled out soon is Rochester Commons, which uh, sits in one north, and we will have uh, you know beautiful greenery and surroundings. At the same time, it is also a green mark platinum property, which means uh, energy water savings as well. So with COVID nineteen, um, what we have, of course. This discovered is that other than just the the environmental, it is about social. So in the uh, real estate world and actually in the capital markets world, the term that's very often used is ESG, and that's environmental, social, and governance. So a lot of investors are looking at companies from the ESG perspective. When they evaluate whether they should be investing in a company, they are no longer just looking at profit. They're looking at the, the, how the company manages the environmental, the social, and the, how the, govern, the company is governed. So with COVID-19, we have discovered that the, e, the S in the ESG has been elevated by a lot of the investors. And of course, when uh, uh, it struck us, uh, everyone by surprise, we all really scrambled to get everything together, but because we have uh, built a pretty strong foundation in the past, we're able to be to manage this quite well, to be very resilient. And that, in, that I think the utmost importance for us in the S is about our occupiers, our staff, 
and to take care of their health and safety needs. And this cut across globally, um, not just Singapore, but elsewhere in the world. So we were able to, to uh, get aid and uh, financially, both financially as well as to, to uh, bring all the services to our customers very readily. In addition to that, it is also about using technology to help us to manage our properties better. So in the past uh, few years, actually facial recognition has been in the, has been very advanced in China. And we were starting to roll that out in Singapore last year before COVID-19. So when this COVID-19 struck, we're all ready. Uh, at that time, frankly, nobody in, in Singapore, people were very, concerned about using facial recognition because it, about data security and all that. But with COVID, I think they, people are actually very glad that with facial recognition because you no longer have to touch any surfaces. But in addition to that, we're continuing to look at new ways of doing things, new ways to make our environment safe and uh, 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 to, to protect the well-being of our occupiers as well. So in our master plan, what we are rolling out uh, is in consideration of uh, the next 10 years. It is going to be a blueprint. And I said, is to really galvanize all the efforts across capital land in so many countries and to go on a common purpose so that we can make, we can maximize our impact. And in this, we are looking at all our stakeholders. We deal with so many different types of stakeholders that we try to meet every single one and to try to balance all the different needs. And it is going to be very holistic. Like I said, it is not just about the environment, but the social and the governance aspect. We view innovation as very important because a lot of the problems that we have today cannot be solved with today's technology. So we're going to continually look at innovation through many different ways. Uh, uh, and uh, also collaboration. We cannot solve the problems alone, but it needs an ecosystem to do that. Finance is extremely important, um, and I will touch a little bit about that later on. And the other thing is that's very important to us is about measuring turn on sustainability. So we want to be able to capture value creation, and then that will spur more innovation and more um, activities within the organization to want to do better. So it is about measuring the value that we can derive from sustainability. So in our master plan, uh, as I mentioned, in the environment aspect, uh, it is about low carbon transition. Basically, how do you, we are, uh, all the buildings, the built envir environment contribute 40% to the carbon emission. So how can we transit? And it's about transition. We cannot achieve the low carbon over time, overnight, but it is about transitioning to a low carbon environment. Social is about our employees, it's human capital. And with COVID, we realized that supply chain has become a lot more uh, glaring. So it's about how do we diversify our supply chain to ensure the sustainability of our business. Sustainability is, is about longevity of the business. So we need to look at that and also health and safety of our occupiers. Governance is, uh, uh, I think, no, needs no further introdu introduction. And with our presence in so many countries uh, and being the large, one of the largest companies in, in Asia, we want also to lead in sustainability. So that means having to embed sustainability in every single part of our real estate life cycle right from investment all the way to our operations, the design. Um, so in, in investment, every single investment uh, that goes through our investment committee would have gone through a rigorous process of uh, seeing whether that, that particular property is sustainable or not. If not, then how do we close the gap? How much does it cost to make it sustainable? What kind of savings can we get from being sustainable? And then we assess, and then before we approve the investment. So that starts from there. And then from there, design, if it's a new property, how can we put in sustainable materials uh, or our processes and, and sustained materials, and then also health and safety of our workers? You know, I think that's become a, a lot more uh, important these days with COVID. 
right? And then and then so forth. Procurement will be the supply chain. So so that it becomes very holistic and it becomes a very natural process for our uh, our business. So about finance, uh, so far we have raised uh, $3 billion and we will continue to do that. So in sustainable finance, there are many types. So in the uh, one that is linked to our sustainable performance is about is called the sustainability linked loans. And what it means is that when we are able to reach certain benchmarks, we get a discount in our interest rate. And the thinking behind this is that when you are sustainable, your risk is the risk should be lowered. And with the lowering of risk, the interest rate should be lower. So, so this gives us a lot of uh, 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 incentive and the motivation to want to do more sustainability. So it's like a vicious, it's a it's circular economy, I would say, right? So you get the savings and you can use the savings to uh, prong, prong it into the more sustainable efforts, more innovation, and then you get you become um, more and more sustainable. So, in fact, MES is, uh, is is targeting for Singapore to be an international sustainable finance center. So, as a result of this, a lot of banks are also very interested in to, in providing sustainable finance for companies, uh, including SMEs. And perhaps uh, I'm not sure whether Prescott will be uh, uh, sharing a bit more about this, but DBS is one of our great supporters, by the way. So uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention and we'll be glad to discuss this further later on. Thank you. I'll hand it thank back you. to Jessica. Thank you very much, Lynette, for those insights. I'm super excited about your master plan and you can see Capital Land here again, paving the way for the real estate industry, perhaps for others to emulate as well, um, you know, where, where your targets and your strategy are concerned. I'd now like to invite Prescott to share with us his views on DBS's journey. Prescott, over to you. Thank you so much. I'm I'm very honored to be part of this uh, quite impressive panel. So thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to tell a few stories today uh, very quickly. And my hope is that these stories will help anybody at uh, whatever role you're in to be able to um, affect kind of high impact sustainability. Uh, and I'm hoping maybe I will bust a few sustainability myths and uh, maybe tell you how to leverage kind of corporate sustainable commitments as well. So, um, yeah, so we, just to tell the why on this, we had this, uh, we're, we're very humbled and honored. DBS has won a number of awards on being the best bank, the best digital bank, best everything in the world. So at that point, what do you what do you do? So we decided that well, it's not enough. Once we you can be the best, but how do you become the best for the world instead of just for your own company and shareholders? So what we decided to do on the operations side is we're going to work towards a very lofty goal, which is be uh, carbon neutral and zero waste by 2030. Very lofty goal. So how do you do that? Um, so we we one of the ways is we made this commitment uh, back in 2018, and that is uh, we were the first Asian bank and Singapore company to join this global uh, renewable initiative called RE100. And the commitment we made is here, and we said we will have all renewable operations in Singapore by 2030, and then we will uh, eventually go all renewable operations in all of our markets in Southeast Asia. So once we've made that commitment, we had to figure out, okay, how? And how do we do that while having a good ROI to the bank? If we can find it, how do we do that while aligning with our other sustainability pillars of being in responsible business and responsible operations and honoring our commitment to social enterprises? So uh, this is from experience and from some of these stories is we ended up with these three principles that give us the highest impact in our sustainability programs focus on impact, ask the right questions, and then transform how you design things. So I'll tell little stories on each of those. So focusing on impact, I'm gonna talk about it in as if it's tech, software and hardware is one of the stories. So in this case, I mean software as maybe a, a behavior-based campaign, maybe an education campaign. And it honestly is one of the myths uh, that I've seen in a lot of sustainability programs, which is that this is the first thing to do. You educate all of your people on how to be more sustainable. You get them to swap clothes and buy less stuff and sustainability happens. 
the hardware piece is, and then there's another myth involved in hardware, which is that uh, getting more efficient and going sustainable is expensive. You have to buy a lot of expensive solar panels. You buy a lot of expensive stuff, and then you have to wait a while and returns come in. Um, so one of the, I'll tell this in a little bit of a story. This was, I'm going to call this a, a software program we had, which is we had this uh, great program called the, the Eco Cup campaign. We did a whole lot of education of ourselves on various sustainable programs. Uh, we measured a whole lot of things, how much waste we were recycling, how much energy we used. We gamified it like everybody likes to do. We, we gamified this department against this to how much more could you reduce. Um, and what we found is we had pretty we had pretty high impact, uh, but it was a little bit short lived, except in the places where we combined it with the with the hardware. So on the hardware side, uh, for example, let's say you 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 teach everybody how to bring their own cup or why it's important to bring their own cup, et cetera. On the hardware side, which is systems, you can change how you deliver your coffee, for example, such that it favors more on bring your own cup, or maybe you take out the single use plastics and you, you combine it with something else. Where we had those programs that worked together, they had lasting impact. Where we had the pieces of the program that had only one or the other, where we changed the infrastructure or the systems, without the education, there was pushback. Where we had only the education, it, 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 it dwindled off after some time. So my point here is to do both and do them together. So this is uh, one of our, I'm gonna call it a, a hardware project, but it also I'm hoping to bust one of the myths about having to spend a lot of money on various types of efficiency. I won't get too much into the tech of this, but essentially we started a program where we just looked at the programming of all of our building management systems. And the ones where we could uh, keep exactly the same comfort, or in most cases, better comfort for the employees, um, but change how we were making settings. Essentially, we, we stopped cooling places where there weren't people. And we stopped cooling places uh, before people came and after people left and maybe during lunches. And we changed settings so that we had better uh, humidity control. This had zero cost to us, meaning it took us time, but we didn't spend any money on any new equipment. And we ended up on those cooling systems where we did this 24% reduction. This is huge in cooling systems in offices uh, at zero cost. So this was a, a pretty strict hardware change. Uh, we actually had to do a lot of software on this too, because we had to explain to people what we were doing as it, as it went on. So just to give kind of an overall bit on our renewable energy strategy, uh, to show how we even thought about this. And okay, so we have to be all renewables. I, I've made this very, these are real uh, graph lines from a financial model that we have, but the, the numbers are all out of here. But you start with energy optimization and you can see kind of our scenario cost goes up a bit. You would invest a bunch. And then you we, we decided we're building a lot of behind the meter solar on all of our buildings. I'm sure some of those requests have uh, come across Lynette's desk at this point. Um, and then we change how we're designing everything. And I'm going to tell more stories about that later. But once you're designing a space, what if you design it net zero? What if you design it kind of fully circular? What does that look like? So you put a lot into that. And what we learned in our financial models is eventually that will save a lot of money um, in, in renewables, even while meeting renewable energy commitments. And once you combine that with large renewable uh, contracts and then renewable energy credits at the end, um, then, you know, it, overall, over this long period of time, it is actually a good investment. So the second principle is ask the right questions. I want to tell a quick story about this wonderful program called The Giving Tree that started just because we asked ourselves the right question. Um, and this came from, we knew we were supposed to uh, keep sustainability in the DNA of everything we did. So we were working on a very small project that we work on in operations every year, which is just Christmas decorations. But instead of asking ourselves, hey, what, how do we make our Christmas decorations a bit more sustainable? We asked ourselves a different question. We asked, what do decorations look like if they make the world better? And because we asked ourselves the question that way, we came up with this uh, program, which happened last year, and we're repeating it this year. And we ended up with actually much more than Christmas decorations. We ended up with this proposal from our social enterprise partner. Um, 
Edible Garden City, which is we had these decorations made from used wooden shipping pallets that were, you know, going to be incinerated. So they built these trees out of them for us and we decorated them with things that could only be used or eaten. I guess that's being used. So seed bombs, plants, uh, kind of these wonderful toys also made out of um, out of these used shipping pallets. Uh, and then they were made such that you could take them apart and put them back together in a different shape. So they also became our Chinese New Year decorations. And we, we decorated those with the used and bao uh, envelopes. And they became these wonderful, beautiful uh, Chinese New Year decorations for us as well. And then we took them down and we're building them into our sites. Uh, in this case, specifically in our Asian Treasures Lounge. <laughs> so uh, we, we asked ourselves this question, how does this make a better world? And we ended up with so much more. We ended up with wonderful support of a great social enterprise partner in Singapore. We ended up with uh, Christmas decorations. We ended up with Chinese New Year decorations and we ended up with furniture all from this one simple project. So then the, the last idea is transforming design. So we are thinking about this in terms of, so we talked about this urban space in these, these urban business parks, what do you do? Well, we ask ourselves the right question. Every time we're renovating a space, every time we're doing a new space, how do we make the world better with that space? And how do we make the space better for our users, which in our case is our employees? So this has led to a number of things, thinking about, uh, thinking about uh, zero energy, full circular economy materials, but also we've ended up with some very fun things like this community farm in the middle of a business park where we're now, we're, we're planting this organic farm where uh, we're gonna have this wonderful food for, for our community right in, uh, right in the middle of our park. And it's actually making everybody very excited. All right, so just a little wrap up. Number one, focus on impact. Don't focus on what makes you feel good. Uh, focus, on, focus on the things that do the most. Uh, that will leverage your commitment to high impact sustainability. Uh, number two, change your mindset. Ask yourself the right question. What would it look like if it made the world better? And you can do this in almost any role. You don't have to be a sustainability manager. Uh, the person who initially asked that questions was a, a, someone who worked in facilities whose job it was to buy decorations. So whatever you're doing, how does, how does uh, printing make the world better? What would it look like? What would it look like if your carpets made the world better? Just whatever you're doing, ask yourself that question. And then transformation in design. You can't optim we can't optimize our way out of this problem. We are going to have to transform the way we design everything and the way we start. So there it is. With that, I will turn it back over to this, uh, again, impressive and honorable panel. Thank you so much, Scott, for your story, and also for all the speakers, for all your information presented. I think we have a lot of food for thought now. Moving into the interactive dialogue, I'd now like to encourage our audience to switch the grid view so you can have a better look of our speakers, and also to encourage your participation by submitting your questions into our Q&A box, and I will take some of them later. Coming back to Kelvin, I'd like to ask you the first question. And you know, JDC is our industrial landlord, and obviously you play a very key role in the decarbonization of Singapore's economy. So how is JDC tracking the emissions of the industrial sector? And how are you bringing on board both SMEs and multinationals who are in your industrial parks to get on your sustainability journey? Uh, thank you, Jessica. It's an interesting question. Uh, uh, as I said earlier, uh, Singapore needs a diversified economy. So manufacturing will continue to be a important activity in Singapore. So definitely we are tracking them closely. And uh, if we can look at our carbon emission, it probably uh, takes out about one quarter to one third of our total emission. So it's definitely an area that we need to handle. Uh, well, we can, you, 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 when, when it comes to the government, everybody will think that why don't you just uh, in regulations to manage the whole issue. But uh, frankly, that would be very irresponsible if the industry is not ready uh, to meet the regulation. And therefore, we actually need to uh, educate the industry and make them ready uh, to build out the enough capability in order to uh, achieve the kind of regulation that we're going to put in class later on. Uh, so with that, what JDC did was we tried to lead the way. Uh, at to be very frank, we are only at the start of the journey. So we are about nudging our industry and starting a position to socialize them to the, to the idea of sustainability. 
uh, to this mainly relates to our SMEs uh, because a lot of the MNCs are when we uh, have a conversation, conversation with them, they are really quite well established in their sustainability roadmap. Uh, that being said, uh, we try to lead our way. Uh, we try to do things like the solar and uh, plant trees, things that are simple yet uh, uh, can show that it's not a cost. It's something that is uh, more receptible uh, uh, to the to the SMEs, and then uh, once we show that it can be done, we even uh, open up our contract to allow them to make it easier for for them to join our sustainability uh, effort. So, for example, our solar uh, contract, we are now allowing our companies to tag along uh, and join our solar uh, with the kind of terms and conditions perhaps uh, that we are more familiar with, so they can uh, not be worried about all the contractual issues. Uh, so that's one way. Then the other part is, um, uh, I say about nudging the companies and starting them on the conversation. Uh, and to do that, uh, as and when we engage the companies, we will actually start this conversation about sustainability. But to do that, even before we start to do that, we have to educate our own officers about sustainability. And this is something that we've been doing for the last couple of years. Thank you so much, Calvin, for that perspective from the public sector. Moving to the private sector, I'd like to come to Lynette. Lynette, you know, real estate industry has been greatly affected by COVID-19. And I think you shared in your presentation, you know, that the, e, the S out of the ESNG is something that you've been focusing more on. But in terms of your overall group sustainability strategy, has COVID kind of accelerated or slowed down your efforts because, you know, the global economic outlook is so uncertain? Yeah, thanks for the one great question, uh, Jessica. Um, sustainability is, in fact, uh, has been an ongoing activity within the organization. And with COVID, I think it's raised the consciousness of what an impact of uh, something that is uncertain can do to the business and upend, upend a lot of different things. But with uh, uh, sustainability, it is at the end of the day, it's about climate change and it has been there all along. So if there's something that's there all along, you're not doing anything about it, I think it will be really, um, you need to be out of business. Uh, so I think it is really, COVID has really raised the, the, uh, uh, the awareness amongst all our employees and our business units that we need to do something that is, uh, may not be urgent today, but will be and it's getting more and more urgent. So I think it has helped to elevate our sustainability efforts. Um, and in addition to that, I think there's also the external pressure because a lot of the investors, large institutional investors, and of which BlackRock is the most vocal, you have heard, and there's a growing list of investors who are very conscious about embedding ESG into an organization's uh, uh, business operations. So that has been another driving force. And uh, so with unique capital, right? And then the incentive is that the sustainable finance is also becoming um, more and more readily available. So that is also incentivized us to be more sustainable. So I think it's multiple factors that has actually, it's not sudden, but then you see, you hear a lot more about sustainability becoming more and more important. And that's why it is in, important to mainstream that into a company's operations. Because if you do sustainability as just a side effort and you don't see the impact of that in your business, there's less motivation for any company to do that. But when it becomes a, a, a part of your core of what you do, then all your employees, your business units who actually control a lot of things, right? Uh, they, they are the ones to get bring in the revenue then they will be more motivated to be on this journey with you thank you so much Lynette. i think it's so encouraging to see that capital has got such a long-term view on esg challenges and sustainability and i think you're absolutely right that sustainability has to be at its core it's not you know just some csr effort at the site that a company takes on so really encouraging to hear that prescott i'm going to come to you because i mean dbs is a bank and you know you've made lots of these commitments and renewable energy is something that's uh you know increasingly popular for companies to offset their emissions and just this week you see the big tech companies like google and Facebook announcing climate zero targets and they are going to be completely carbon neutral. And so, you know, from your perspective, you know, what are some of the challenges in buying, you know, renewable energy credits and verifying that they are high quality and ensuring that, you know, that your your operations are being powered by, by clean energy? Yeah, thanks. Um, so there's, uh, yeah, 
it there there's a there's a bit of an art to it uh luckily there's some certifications on renewable energy credits if you're interested in those uh so you generally buy the the ones that have the various certifications or you make them yourself so for example if you, with our our solar arrays on our on our rooftops i don't need anybody to certify those credits i know where they're from it's like growing your own food i guess uh we just make them Otherwise, you know, we, we, we generally like to buy the IREX or the Tigers or, or another certified type. Um, and, and sometimes you're held to it. So we made the RE100 commitments, of course. So RE100 only accepts certain types of, of what they consider to be high quality RECs. So you can just follow the guidelines. Um, but I will note uh, renewable energy credits are a, a good way to help finance the uh, uh, renewable energy uh, grids in various markets. But they're not probably the first way to go. You'll notice in my uh, in my slide, they weren't the first thing for us to do is to buy RECs. In fact, they were last. So first we invested in um, energy uh, reductions, and then we invested in building our own behind the meter solar, and then we invested in kind of change, uh, transformation in how we design, and then a green energy contract, and then we'll, we'll close gaps with RECs. So there's how I think about it first, which is there's lots of things to do first before you do RECs. And then if you want high quality ones, you can get certified RECs. Um, That's I will note on financing of them, yeah, indeed I'm from a bank, but I'm not a finance person. We are also very proud, I know, to be partners uh, with Capital Land and, and all the people who are using sustainable linked loans. Um, those can be used for financing renewable projects, I, I do know. And there's, there's sustainability linked loans, there's ESG linked loans, there's renewable energy finance for the projects, and then there's transformation projects to like decarbonize whatever your industry is. So I know there's whole packages. Uh, I just don't know things about numbers. <laughs> Thank you so much Scott, for your insights. Um, and you're, you're right, you know, sustainable finance is absolutely uh, something that's growing. And, and we just, EcoBusiness, hosted a, a, a forum called Unlocking Capital for Sustainability just last week, in which we can see how the finance industry is coming up with such innovative products to get SMEs and companies on board and actually tie their ESG performance to financial benefits. And I'd like to encourage everyone here, uh, you know, who's joined us to um, go and look at that because these loans are not only just for the listed companies, they are also for SMEs um, and they really truly do reward good behavior, good and responsible behavior. So very happy to hear that. Um, these questions have started to come in and, and I'm just going to perhaps direct this question at you, um, Prescott, since it's about digitalization and DBS has obviously, you know, made a name itself for being the digital bank. Um, and the question is, how has digitalization supported your firm's ESG and sustainability initiatives and very specifically in enforcing monitoring or implementing the, these initiatives in the real estate industry? Yep, quite a bit. Um, and also on the social side of our ESG as well. Um, I know we, we work very hard at doing things like helping to uh, bring digital banking to migrant workers, for example, and to rural communities in our markets uh, in India, for example, uh, where we have a, a large digibank footprint. So, uh, Digitalization is quite important. And then if you think about it, uh, every time you have enough people in digital banking, uh, you don't have to build branches. You don't have to build, uh, maybe not the greatest thing to tell all of my landlords and, uh, and real estate professionals here, but if you can right size your, your real estate footprint and grow digitally, it's obviously much less of a, uh, it's much less of environmental footprint as well. And then on the, I think you're getting at also kind of the smart building and measuring side. Yeah, data can be, if you leverage it correctly, here's how I would say it. If you leverage it correctly, you can use data to pinpoint and, and kind of correctly link yourself with a lot of sustainable, uh, with a lot of sustainable programs and, and give it the highest impact that it can give. Wonderful, thank you. I'm going to come to you because there's a question here that was something that I wanted to ask you anyway. And that is that, you know, Capital Land has had a long-term sustainability strategy and along the way, I'm sure you've had some challenges. So one of the questions here is, you know, how do you overcome the challenges that you encounter when you want to implement your sustainability strategy? Do you have any, you know, on the ground stories, war stories to share with us? Uh, the challenges are ongoing. I think the first thing you must have perseverance. <laughs> and, uh, 
Yeah, I, th I think first of all, um, of course, I think the stakeholder engagement is very important to help people understand what sustainability is all about. But it's uh, not just speaking, but then to really come with a, a impact. I think the impact and to demonstrate impact of doing some things. And that means data is very important. So uh, that question about digitalization, I also want to touch a little bit about that because with digitalization, then you can date, get data. And we've been actually tracking our performance uh, from 12 years ago, and we continue to do that. And we upgrade that to include more and more factors. So initially, uh, it's environmental factors, which are more easily uh, measurable, but uh, we are our next level of project, the elevation is to bring in health and safety factors and more and more data. I think with data, then you can show impact. You measure and you monitor your data and you show impact. And then with that also, you can then go to the banks and say, look, we've achieved so much. And these are the savings we have done, we have achieved as a result of being sustainable. Then you can get the better financing. So I think at the end of the day, you can say so much to your stakeholders, but it is about the results that matter. So I think uh, I mean there are a lot of uh, different kinds of challenges, but I think this is this is will be the most impactful. I would advise. Wonderful, thank you, Linda. Just while I have you here, there is a question here for you specifically, and it's regarding sustainable construction materials. Um, so perhaps you can share with us, you know, when Capital Land uses its materials, how do you go about, you know, uh, finding the innovation? So for this specific question, is Capital Land using any low carbon concrete, such as concrete augmented with fly ash, etc.? Yeah, so I think when we look at materials, uh, we, we will look at it from a very holistic perspective. Uh, low carbon is one thing that meets the one aspect, low carbon, but what about the strength? Strength of the concrete, the durability. So this will have to undergo a lot of testing on our part. Uh, and uh, so it is pretty rigorous and, and it will take some time. Uh, at the same time, it's also about cost. So we will need to look at the cost benefit analysis. And uh, I mentioned about the investment process that we go through, the investment process, and that's the kind of uh, uh, um, cost benefit analysis that we actually have to run to see whether we're having this. We're not looking in the term uh, uh, results, and that's why the master plan is important. Master plan is a 10 year program, right? So that's why we want to, Kind of a uh, um, move people's mindset to know to to know that sustainability is will generate long term positive impact. So once you shift people's mindset to that way, then they they will be begin to embrace sustainability better. Wonderful, thanks, Lynette. Calvin, I'll come to you because you mentioned sustainable construction just now during your presentation, and JDC obviously built a lot of infrastructure. So how how are you looking at this topic? Okay, thanks for coming to me. Actually, uh, was, uh, I was looking at the Q&A while uh, the questions come in. Uh, I have some thoughts about that. I think, frankly, as a startup in Singapore, uh, I think that you are in a good place. Uh, is, you are in a place whereby uh, perhaps uh, some of the companies are more uh, uh, receptive to use your materials. At the same time, Singapore has a certain brand name. I'm sure as a startup, you are not looking at only Singapore as a market. That cannot be the case. You are looking at... Uh, uh, selling it to uh, to the global market and uh, use I think you can use Singapore as a springboard test your material try it in Singapore establish a certain uh, branding uh, be trusted and then move overseas I thought that is one aspect that perhaps uh, you you can make use of your uh, our Singapore branding so uh, when it comes to rigorous uh, uh, testing uh, yes is a very uh, heavily regulated area and for good reasons because uh, like what Lynette shared uh, is about the strength and durability of the buildings. Uh, so that part, uh, again, uh, include that as an aspect when you try in, uh, say, for example, in the Singapore projects. Uh, I think our authorities, uh, for example, the uh, in terms of uh, construction material, it will be the Building and Construction Authority. They are now very receptive and uh, very proactive in promoting uh, such uh, trials. Uh, there are many uh, funds and uh, 
grants that we uh, that can support the startup in all these trials. So I, I, if you need some help, you can always write to me. I, I can uh, point you to some of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Kelvin, for volunteering that. <laughs> I'm going to come to uh, Jessica, if I yeah. could jump in as well on the yeah. innovation aspect. Uh, mm. We have, uh, actually, we just, we are uh, announcing a setup of a smart lab which is an innovation lab at Science Park 2, where we are bringing in all the different technologies together to pilot. And sustainability is one of the pillars that we are looking at. So, so we welcome all ideas to, so that we can all co-develop together you know, innovation in this area. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lynette. Prescott, I'm going to come to you, um, to, you know, kind of wrap up the session. There's a question here that I thought was quite interesting, and it comes from uh, someone called Keegan. And it's, you know, you can make the business case for energy efficiency and renewable energy, but how do you make the business case for non-related energy investments like your community farm, for example, which you shared? Um, and also, you know, is there some other arguments uh, for, for investing in sustainability that might not have such an obvious ROI? Sure. Yeah. Thanks. And thanks, Keegan. I will. Uh, first, I want to say I, I happen to have poured myself with uh, fly ash concrete and with slag concrete, which have very different. Uh, they pour very differently is what we learned. Um, this was not here, but it, it, it's, of course, true that we have to we, we're going to have to do the testing on it. I, I was not I was not making high rises. So dealing with it in high rises is going to be more difficult. Um, but I, I did want to say that here's the thing I know about the concrete and I don't without solutioning with fly ash and slag concrete. The one thing we know in the construction industry is we know we're going to have to solve this problem. We know we cannot. We, if you look at the high carbon pieces of what we use, concrete, steel and glass, we know we have to solve those problems. So uh, regardless of looking at fly ash, we're got, we. we Everybody here knows this is this is a thing staring at us, and we have to dig in and solve it. Um, I'm hoping uh, finance can help with that because I have heard from multiple people we have the technical solutions. Somebody somewhere knows how to make low carbon and carbon positive concrete. They have proofs of concept out there. We know how to make the same class. We know how to make it with steel, but the industry needs a whole lot of money to transform. I am hoping the transformation loans and the sustainability link loans can transform the industry that way. I don't know, but I really hope so. Uh, as far as making the business case for these other things, Keegan is exactly right. I cannot show an ROI on my urban farm. There's, I can't do it, but the, it, you know, some smart people have said, show me the business case for ruining the environment. You can't show me that either. So uh, I, I will note that we spend money, all of us spend money on employee perks anyway. We spend money on our spaces. A lot of us are in the, the, in the business of making sure people have a good, safe place to work that is productive for them. This is what this goes into. That the urban farm makes a better, safer, more productive place, and it happens to give us more oxygen and food and makes us happier by having, you know, biophilic place for us to work. So if you have a program that you want to do that you cannot show a short term ROI on, show the benefits the same and compare it to other things you spend money on. There's my advice on that. Wonderful. Thank you, guys. And I'm actually a uh, tenant at Capital Land, so I'm hoping to see more urban farms in the yeah, buildings uh, soon to come. Um, I'm just going to wrap up uh, the, the panel with an eye on the time. With this one last question, which I actually wanted to ask the panelists, but somebody, uh, we've got a question here from Kelvin, who's asked a similar question, and that is that sustainability you know, in his view, has been more focused on ESG performance, but perhaps what's not so obvious is the economic performance of it. And I think what he's trying to ask you really is how do you reconcile sustainability efforts with profit? And we've heard from Pescott, we've heard from Lena and Calvin that it's not necessarily expensive. You were busting that myth, myth but the sustainability directly contribute to your bottom line. Perhaps I can get the panelists to share this view and also to just kind of uh, give your, your, your wrap up, your closing comments. And uh, I invite uh, perhaps Calvin to go first? Sure. Uh, from the government's perspective, we think that, uh, well, it seems like a cost today. Uh, but as all the countries are now uh, required to meet the emission requirements uh, in the next couple of decades, uh, it will equalize and no longer be a cost. And in fact, if you are someone that uh, 
catch on this later, it will be a cost to you because you do not know what to do. And uh, and as I said earlier, uh, we think there is opportunity for us to invest in this area. So yes, it might be a cost now, but we are now betting as a long term, just like how the Singapore government plans. Uh, we are we are looking at for a longer term perspective, and we think that what we invest today uh, will likely be uh, something that we can get payback in the future. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kelvin and Lynette. I think that's a great question because it's often asked by um, business units. So that's why we are attempting to measure that. Uh, for a start, we the cost avoidance that we have achieved since 2009 in our reduction in our uh, water and energy consumption has amounted to $208 million. That's about 11% of our operating expenses. That's pretty substantial, you know. So when you show this kind of figures, people will sit up and say, wow, that's so much. And that's that will spur them to doing more. That's why in our investment right now, every single investment before we put money to buying an, an, a property, uh, uh, constructing some, we're going to look at those kind of figures with and without stability and uh, looking at the ROI. So that will then help us to, you know, direct our efforts to, uh, more sustainable projects. Thank you so much, Lynette. And finally, Prescott, over to you. Yeah, I'd like to tell stories, but I, I know I don't have time. <laughs> so very, very short. There's there there is this story that will, I'll only tell the punchline. But in the uh, in the in the stimulus bill in two thousand and nine. That when the government of the US was building a, a lot shovel ready projects to try to stimulate the economy, the Department of Energy went back and said, You've already given us the budgets and everything for these. How sustainable can you make these? And the punchline is they came back with no more on in the budget, the same exact budgets. They came back with something insane, like a 37 to 52 percent reduction in energy use of those buildings once they were built. And the, the designers said, well, you didn't ask us before. We met the requirements before. So the, the thing is, we're, we're spending too much money. The, the other thing I will say is on the bottom line. Uh, in vet, meeting climate change uh, commitments is going to be cheaper than more projects like building seawalls and raising up airport runways. Uh, meeting, uh, not building coal plants is going to be cheaper than paying for lung cancer treatments. But the fact is, it, in a, on a macro scale, it pays off very well. There's a great ROI on most sustainability things. Um, on a micro level, yeah, you'll have to find it within your own businesses, and I understand that's harder, but we all know we have to. Um, and generally, uh, we, they do pay off. You just have to look for it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Prescott. I think that was a really interesting analogies that we can really take with us from this webinar. And on that note, I really like to thank our three speakers today for such an informative and engaging session. I really enjoyed moderating this discussion and also all the questions that have come in. We didn't have time to go through all of them, but I would like to encourage our attendees today to continue engaging on this very important topic with all the organizations here. Um, we also like to encourage that uh, you actually try and adopt the Giving Tree initiative, which is something that's very simple, reducing and limiting, eliminating the use of non-recyclable materials. And we'd also love to hear what you think of the program and the proposed initiative. So if you can scan this QR code that you see in front of you and give us your feedback, um, that would be great. So on this note, I'd like to thank Bridge Plus and JTC for co-organizing this webinar series on sustainability. If you want to find out more information about both organizations, please do Google them on the website. And I hope to stay in touch with all of you. So thank you very much, everyone.